Well, Chris, thank you so much for having us. We are here in your new room at Sterling Sound, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, tell us this, a little bit about the journey from Chelsea to this location and how you ended up here. So years ago, maybe it was about, God, we've been here for about five, six years now. So about seven or eight years ago, our lease was ending in Chelsea Market and we were going to re-up and then Google bought the building. So our rent was astronomical, the number that they came at us with. So we're like, okay, we have to move. And at the time, Ted Jensen was like, I think I want to move out of New York. So he came up with moving to Nashville. We built a studio there and we were searching all over New Jersey, Brooklyn, all these different places. People were like chiming in like Brooklyn. I, I thought Brooklyn was great, but I'm from Jersey. And we wound up looking at um, Hoboken, Jersey City, Union City, and then we wound up here in Edgewater in a post office that we, you know, the, the building here is perfect for us. So we moved in here and uh, built four amazing rooms, and it's just, been, it's just been great since we've been here. I love these rooms, Northward Acoustic Design. Um, Thomas was, like, unbelievable to deal with the whole time. He could, we couldn't have picked a better, you know, designer to work with. That's so. amazing. And he designed this location and the Nashville location. Yes, correct? both both places, yeah. It, Nashville location is a couple square feet bigger in each room, but it was just because we could. And here is, you know, what, what we were, you know, what we could build here. But these rooms are actually the perfect size for this system. Like, is, you know, if, you, if he was going to build and you said make it the perfect size, it would be this size. So, so, you know, one thing that I found very interesting is that you know everybody on the internet gets to see these beautiful rooms but there's actually a whole network of other rooms here at sterling where there's people working every day and one thing that you brought up is that there was a design you know process and thought behind the fact that all of these rooms are the same so it makes work for those people that that was i you know it was one of my ideas that the assistants could come up and work in these rooms and a lot of times, you know, the assistants are working at night. They're working for us all day doing production in all the production rooms downstairs. And if they have to do a session and they want to do it in this big room, in one of the big rooms, they are kind of like stuck to like my assistant would only work in here and Randy's assistant would only work in his room. But if Randy's working till midnight that night, then his assistants couldn't get in here or in his room. So... With these rooms being the same, any assistant has the ability to come into any room at night and work, and all they have to do is log into the computer because the systems are the same. You know, you use your, you know, maybe outboard gear is different, but your internal system is exactly the same, and the rooms sound the same, so you're up and running in a room right away. And, uh, you know, one of the other reasons was if anything happened in a room, you could be able to go into another room and work and not be stuck if we made, you know, we did a... When we installed the Atmos in this room, I was out of work for, you know, a couple of weeks. I mean, I went away for a couple of weeks, but when I came back, I had to do work at night in other rooms. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was just totally easy because I'm up and running working and hearing everything exactly the same way I wouldn't hear. So. Okay. And as far as Atmos goes, is this currently the only Atmos room here at the Edgewater facility? Yes. I mean, we have an Atmos pre-production room downstairs, but it's not the same as this. This is full-blown mm -hmm. Atmos. Um, we have one in Nashville, too. Um, so are you primarily mastering, you know, the Atmos projects that come in here, or do other people come and utilize your room as well? No, we have a kid, Zach, who comes in here at night, and he does Atmos mastering and Atmos mixing. Okay, awesome. So, yeah. Is the Atmos mixing through Sterling, or are their clients reaching out to Sterling for Atmos it's, mixing? Everything's through Sterling. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. So there's been a few projects that... You know, I mastered the project. The label reached out to us and said, hey, do you have somebody who can mix or master Atmos? And we're like, yeah, we have somebody. So it's actually turned out really well for the projects that we've done here to get the mixes done here as well because he can listen to the stereo masters and base his Atmos mixing and mastering on what the stereo mix sounds like yeah. and, and hear it in the room that it was mastered. Absolutely. In. I was just going to say the continuity between, you know, the, you know, the steps in that process. And then also I'm assuming that if he shows up with an Atmos mix that you're going to master, if anything needs to be changed, it's very, simple. it's yeah. Just hearing it in the same room makes it so much easier to understand. You're not, you know, like a lot of times with Atmos, it's done somewhere else and then it comes here and you're like, Oh, well, maybe that's not right. Maybe this isn't right. But when you do it here, you know, when it's the stereos mastered here, 
you know, the Atmos is mixed and mastered here, the continuity is perfect. That's you know, awesome. like you're really getting, you know, the, it's, it's almost this, you know, it's almost too perfect. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, you know, as time has progressed and things have changed in your world and in the mastering world in general, you know, what is something that you believe has really allowed you to become a better, quicker, faster engineer? You know, um, I know that you're doing a lot of this, you know, your work in the box and you're utilizing tools that are digital and tools that are analog. Um, do you ever utilize things like offline bounce if you're completely digital and stuff like that? No, I pretty much do everything, you know, mm -hmm. through standard plugins and, and just run it that way. I also do some stuff, you know, through some analog gear, it depends. Um, but I'm all in the box pretty much because of my workflow. I can come in here and pretty much handle everything I need to handle during the day, including revisions and, and everything like that. Um, you know quickly because it's all it's all in the box you know i mean years ago there's a whole thing about in the box versus analog and it's literally been the journey of music production the entire time when it was tape you had to deal with tape you had to rewind the tape you had to play the tape you had to record the tape you had to do all these things and you had to cut records and that was a physical thing and then you'd make tape copies and that's physical as times changed you know, the, the record labels and the people who you were working with were doing things digitally and they realized it was faster and they want faster reaction to your work. So before I would master something, cut a reference and then ship it to whoever was getting it. Now, at the best in the US, FedEx was a night mm -hmm. to get it. So the next day they listen to it, they get back to me and make changes. You know, Europe and Asia was two days minimum on shipping and then it would be two days later that you would get notes. Hey, I need you to do this and go back and forth. So it was very time consuming just as far as shipping. Um, now with digital, I can do something in the morning. Somebody in Korea could listen to it, you know, whenever they wake up and get back to me with changes immediately and I can make revisions and send them a new file right away. So, you, you know, less than 24 hours to any place in the world, you know, somebody can listen and make revision and I can make revisions and send them back. It's kind of a game changer with like, you know, the way things are released. Back when we did all this analog stuff, records were like, records were mastered in August for Christmas release because they had to approve it, they had to make the records, they had to package them, they had to ship them, they had to get them out by Thanksgiving so that the records would be hot sellers by Christmas. Now today I work on a record on Monday and it's out Friday. There's times I work on records on Thursday and it's out the next day on Friday on streaming platforms. So there's really, you know, the physicality of the music has diminished, but the urgency has gone up tenfold because of the, you know, just if you offer somebody something faster, they want it, they want it faster the next time. <laughs> so the service part of this industry has changed into like, okay, you know, take your time and do your revisions, but we need it right away. You know, Absolutely. like I get people sending me files at six in the morning when I'm not here and they need them by noon, the latest. So, you know, I get here at nine and I have three hours to clear up all these emergencies and it just working in the box makes it so much easier for me to deal with that. that that's amazing. And, you know, as time has progressed and this urgency has taken over the industry, do you ever feel like it ever crosses the line where you try and say okay well a lack of planning on your behalf does not create an emergency on my behalf so my manager my manager liz this is what she says every day you know like she's just like okay you screwed up the entire process and now it's our fault and we have to jump you know we have to jump through hoops to get your record done in an hour you know i mean that's that's the industry that's where we are right now you know and it I don't ever like to rush anything, but there's times where you're kind of like, I have to stop what I'm doing and then go master this song that just came in for an emergency. But at the same time, like I have to listen to it. I have to see, you know, what the song's about. I have to feel what the song's about. And then I have to apply the process I think that it needs. And, you know, you said watching me work is I use a lot of different things to, I, I try a bunch of different things and then I settle with something. And that process takes time. So, you know, in the box is easier than plugging in a whole bunch of stuff. Plus I can have more gear in my 
computer than I can in my room. <laughs> so that's a physical thing too and, you know, whatever. So it's just, yeah, a lot of people, you know, they've gotten to the point where they're like, don't worry, we can master it tomorrow and get it out right away. And then, you know, they call up in the morning, they're like, this is an emergency, it's gotta go out. So <laughs> we're dealing, we're deal yeah, we're, we're, we're cleaning up a lot of messes for people. You know, one thing that I found um, really, really cool is you said that you worked on the new BTS project. And since then, you've been doing a lot of stuff for the other side of the world. Speak a little bit about that. Um, yeah. So years ago, decades ago, it was very hard to work with international clients because of the shipping and the location and people coming in to listen to stuff. And then I guess in the 90s, people were traveling more and coming to sessions. And then as soon as like files came around and you know digital audio workstations and email and being able to send files it kind of changed the game because people didn't have to be there they could they could be wherever they wanted to be and i could work on it and then they could get the files the same day and listen wherever they wanted to listen so people became very comfortable with that and it kind of became the norm and then three years ago when COVID hit nobody could go anywhere but i was here so I was just sending stuff all over the world and people were relying on me, you know, like, okay, he's in, in New Jersey in a studio and we need that, you know, and we can't travel to be there and we can't do this. So people became very dependent on, you know, sending files and doing everything by email mm -hmm. or, you know, the internet or whatever you want to say, you know, like it just became the norm. And now it's, you know, now, you know, I mean, I like having people in because I like, you know, talking to people and meeting people and seeing what they're about, what the music's about. And uh, that doesn't really happen anymore. Everybody's so comfortable with just saying, just send it now and, and, you know, whatever. I get a lot of people who send the stuff and, you know, I'll work on it. And then maybe the next day they come in for like an hour or two hours just to listen to it mm -hmm. and see what it sounds like here before they make decisions. I really like that because I want them to hear it the way I hear it and then make their decisions. When I do something here and people are listening in a bad room, wherever they are, or bad speakers, then I kind of have to talk them down and say, like, hey, like, I don't know where you're listening to it, but I think the bass is right. I think the top end's right. I think the level's right, you know? Yeah, and, you know, you just brought up something that I have found really interesting from the conversation that we've been having, you know, not only about mixing and mastering, but about gear and about processes. You clearly can tell when someone was working in a less than ideal environment on a less less than ideal monitoring system yeah. um can you dial in what if, if can you tell oh this person is they their room's too bright or this this person their room's too dark um is that something that you like hear instantly so in, it's instantly <laughs> like that's the way my brain works when i put music up is like you know, people always say, do you ever listen to music? Like, what do you listen to? And I'm like, I listen to music, but I have to literally switch gears to listen to music because automatically, because I've been doing this for so long, every time I hear a song, I kind of start breaking it down in my head. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, it's it needs to be brighter. It needs bass. You know, the vocals, why are the vocals like, you know, like I just break it down. And like automatically when I put something up, I can tell instantly what I need to do to it. Mm -hmm. it's like and i mean it's broad stroke instantly it's like it needs to be brighter it needs to be this it needs to be that it needs like some kind of glue it's not put together and that's you know real mixers the, the thing with that's happened over the last couple of years too because of covid everybody went out and built a home studio you know sweetwater sound must have made a billion dollars <laughs> you know selling everything they had in stock mm -hmm. during covid because people were like oh i can't get to the studio i'll just do it my own i'll do i'll do all my pre-production on my own and i think they take for granted the talented people that work in studios that actually work in studios and why they're talented and why they're known for doing what they do is because they're really good at it and i feel like a lot of stuff now you know, people went out and bought this home, made these home studios. They, they don't notice the difference between, you know, a Serban mix or a Manny mix or a Josh Goodwin mix compared to like their friends mix who has a home studio. And it's kind of disheartening that they don't realize that. But, you know, 
in the end, I wound up getting the stuff and I have to, I can't tell them like, hey, your mix sucks. I really just have to put everything I know into fixing their mix. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of times I'll give them notes and be like, hey, maybe you could try this or maybe this, but it's the glue that real mixers and real engineers know how to apply and stick stuff together and, you know, create a picture. And uh, that's what I feel. There's kind of like, there's two different types of people. There's people who make a, a sound field and a picture. And when you close your eyes, you see the music, you feel it, it kind of in, in, you know, envelops your body and your mind. And then there's people who just play the music where it's like, I hear the keyboards, I hear the drums, I hear that, but there's nothing magical about it. And that's to me, the, that's the difference today in like, you know, an engineer, a real good engineer working on your stuff and somebody who's just like good, so. That's a great way to put that. Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, it's not to, you know, I'm not saying anything about people coming up. Obviously, there are people coming up. I came up, everybody comes up. But, like, there is a big difference between, you know, a talented engineer and somebody who's coming up. And, you know, if you want, you know, it's hard, it's hard for me to say, oh, you know, oh, you really like this guy's mix or whatever, and you can, you know, reproduce that because you have the same gear at home what we were talking about before the same gear does not make you the same engineer it's the talent that's behind that that makes these mixers special absolutely and so. you know it's been a master class watching the you know your absolute talent in the decision making process you know you said it's this the decisions i don't make and so there's some story about Picasso writing on a napkin and selling it for and he's like this you know the the bottom line is you know i spent 40 years painting and drawing to not give you something fucked up and that's basically you know the way i feel i've been doing this this is my 40th year you know in in the fall i'll be 40 years in in the studio and i feel like when you come to me you're not paying for me you're paying for me not to fuck up your music because mm -hmm. i know what it takes to make it sound good and it's decades of experience of doing that you know whether i whether you want to think i'm doing it really fast or really slow or whatever it's i'm making all the right decisions from the gate mm -hmm. because i know what it takes to sound good on the radio and streaming and everything i've gone through every phase of what music should sound like on each format vinyl cd streaming you know like that's something that you it only comes with experience it's not something that you can just pick up like overnight you know, and that's what I find funny about vinyl now is everybody's like, oh, vinyl sounds so much better. And it's like, it does when it's mastered for vinyl. Yes. When it's just a, a streaming thing ripped off, it doesn't sound better. The streaming definitely sounds better. Mm -hmm. So it's a weird thing. You know, it's like, I, I think a lot of success of everybody at Sterling is literally experience. I mean, it's almost, you know, it's almost the entire thing that we vet people for so long here before they get to like master stuff. You know, to make sure they're doing the right thing, make sure clients are happy, make sure they understand, you know, what their job role is, you know. Absolutely. So. You know, you brought up vinyl. You guys are cutting vinyl again. Yes, we've had, we just had the biggest year cutting vinyl in maybe 20 something years. That's amazing. You know, vinyl's kind of been on the slide and now vinyl's back like every artist releases vinyl now and you know i don't know if it's a collector's item or people like it but you know it's it's back and we're cutting it and we have two guys joe nino hearns and ryan smith who are absolutely like killing it in vinyl these guys are vinyl experts mm -hmm. and they spend so much time like you know mastering their craft of making it sound as best as it can on vinyl. And that's an art form. I did that for years. It's literally an art form, knowing about what you were talking about before, inner diameter distortion and speed and you know how to correct that stuff. DSing stuff on vinyl. It's it's much different than streaming stuff. So in this room, where is the VMS eighty gonna go? <laughs> we're actually thinking about putting one in Greg's room. He doesn't he doesn't know that so when Greg watches. You know, but um, I mean it's a whole thing. It's like a, you know, like the rooms that we have in Nashville are set up for vinyl. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not just like, like, so I know some people have bought lathes and they're just like, oh yeah, I'm going to cut vinyl now. It's like, I don't understand how you could cut vinyl never watching anybody cut vinyl. Like, you know, you go out and buy a race car, a Formula One car. It's not like driving your car. It's a special thing. It's a special process. There's all kinds of things that go on, and that's what it takes to cut vinyl. 
it's a very specialized process. And the more you know, the better you'll be about doing it. And the more experience you have, the better you'll cut vinyl. Absolutely. So it's not something just anybody can get into. It's seriously like watching someone cut vinyl, like direct to disc, not just playing like files back, like mastering the files, EQing the files and going straight to disc. It's a ballet to watch that go on. Mm -hmm. Like you're not sitting, just sitting there. You're standing, you're doing EQs, you're checking stuff, you're moving around the room, looking at the lathe, you're looking at your settings. It's, it's a whole dance that goes on. Yeah, and most you know people even today who consider themselves mastering engineers probably have never seen that or you know talked about it. But it's very you know interesting. Could you describe that a little bit? What it's wor like working with you know um, a pre V path and a monitor path and you know or a program path and a monitor path and it going down. And yeah, so you know for every revolution of the disc, the the preview path and the and the program path are mm -hmm. one revolution delayed. Yeah. So the preview path feeds the screw of the lathe which moves it forward and when there's a lot of loud noise amplitude gets bigger so the lathe has to move faster so it doesn't overcut the next groove when it slows down it cuts an arrow and you have to be when you master it, vinyl you have to know how to set up that preview path so that it moves the lathe the right amount of space mm -hmm. and there are some tricks that go into eqing it like if you have a super dynamic record that you want to make sure you don't get overcuts, you might have to boost the low end in the preview path to make that lathe move constantly move, you know, to the right. So you're yep. not you're not overcutting it or the left, whatever way you're you know, you're just making it move faster. Yes. So yeah, there's a lot of science in that stuff. There's a lot, you know, there's also with the cutter head, there's up and down. So you have to know how to mono the bass, maybe. Mm -hmm. Stereo bass is the worst thing for uh, cutting vinyl because the cutter head doesn't know whether it goes sideways <laughs> or up and down. It <laughs> makes crazy grooves. So there's, you know, there's crossover filters. There's a whole bunch of things that you need to do and not screw up the sound while you're doing all this stuff to make the vinyl better. Mm -hmm. And again, that's a lot of stuff you learn when you're doing it. You know, before that, nobody even has like any, I mean, I know, you know, famous mixers who don't even understand that because they've never done it. And when you do it, then you're like, oh, wow, this is like a new, it's another physical realm of audio, you know, putting it on the disc. You know, and clearly you're still a master of this, but you've said that you haven't cut in how many years? My God, um, maybe like 15 years, over 10 years for sure. So when the new, you know, lathe goes into Greg's room, how long do you think it'll take you to... <laughs> I, you know what, I would want to cut just because I'd want to see, like, I feel like I haven't thought about cutting in a while, but I want to, I, you know, I cut for 20-something years. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I, 25 years I probably cut vinyl, and I feel like I could go back and do it, but... I would definitely be a little shaky in the beginning. You know, like, it depends on what lathe I would have, a VMS-80 or something else, you know. You're getting like, Scully. Scully, there's, you know, I, <laughs> cu I cut on basically every kind of lathe there is. Yep. So um, that definitely made, you know, I think made me a better vinyl engineer, but at the same time, like, I haven't done it in 15 years, so I'd be a little like, oh, my God, what, what do I do? How do I do this, you know? Yeah, you know, I think it's so very interesting that, you know, the world is moving in such a way where digital is allowing people to do other things but then you know other people are saying hey we want to cut a vinyl record again i i think <laughs> the magic with vinyl is that you sit down and you listen to it mm -hmm. you know like streaming you could do anything most people stream they go to the gym they walk they run they're at work they're just like you know go, walking out for lunch or whatever people put in their earbuds and they're listening to music or they're at home listening, uh, you know, on headphones or whatever. And I feel like that the vinyl days, like I told you, I would have friends. We'd go buy records. We'd come back to, you know, my place or my friend's place. You know, we'd smoke some weed. We'd sit down and we'd play vinyl. We'd all sit there together and, like, like listen to the stuff and look at the, you know, look at the records. You know, look at the liner notes. You know, back in liner notes, you'd read, you know, who mixed what, who did what, who was the assistant engineer, who was the mastery engineer. And that's how you learned who these engineers were, mm -hmm. you know, and there's lyrics there. There's all this stuff, you know, that, that was written on the inside. Sometimes just like notes from the artist, they would write stuff about the album, make it, maybe the making of it, what the album means. And you would gain all this information, but you'd be sitting there listening to it. And then, you know, after half the album goes, you go flip the record over, <laughs> cue it up again and listen again. And, you know, I feel like you, you listen to the whole thing. You're listening to the whole album. And at, at worst, you'd listen to half an album. 
Yep. You know, but you were forced to listen to like four, five, or six songs in a row, which kind of made you get into the artist, you know, like really like enjoy the the whole thing instead of like, okay, one song next, one song next. But I feel like maybe that's just the new generation. Maybe that's the way it's going. It's like, I only want to listen to one song of this guy. I, you know, I just want hits. That's what I feel like playlists are. Just <laughs> hits. You know, or new hits or whatever. Maybe someone should start a, a vinyl service where they just print playlists onto vinyl. That would be cool. <laughs> I mean, there used to be... One thing that was cool about vinyl back in the day was that there would be these compilation records. Yes. And it was usually a soundtrack to a movie. Or somebody would just put out a compilation of like... Mm -hmm. You know, a label would say, hey, we have 20 artists on the label. We're going to take 15 of them and showcase them on this vinyl. Or maybe all 20 on a double vinyl and be like, this is the best song from every one of our artists and here's a playlist. And you'd be like, okay, cool. You know, and some labels had different, you know, different things. Maybe some like, you know, African rhythms, maybe some rap, maybe some jazz, maybe some reggae, maybe some rock, maybe some punk. But you'd get like a taste of every artist. And it was kind of a cool way of like, again, sitting and listening to different artists that you might not hear ever and getting to listen to them on a, on a compilation record. I mean, that's what I feel with, like, playlists now is I listen every Friday, like, Friday Spotify playlist comes out, new music. Mm -hmm. Today's Saturday, I got my car this morning, and I put it on, I started listening to it, you know, and just to see what, like, what is everybody talking about right now? What are the number one songs on Spotify? You know, what what is, you know, what is the trend right now of music? Mm -hmm. So, I mean. When you're doing that, do you do that more as a, a music listener and a lover of music or do you do that more as you know a business owner and market research so the spotify playlist thing um if i go for a walk i listen to it as a music listener but if i'm in the car just driving and i'm running errands and stuff like that i'm kind of listening to it as like a little bit of market research and engineering research and just hearing like i like to like i look on the on the spotify and i'm like okay i did this song and this song and I didn't do these three other songs that are around it. So I want to hear, like, where does my mastering stand? Does it, where does my mastering sit with the other stuff? Absolutely. You know, like, does it sound good? Does it sound low? Does it sound bright? Does it sound dull? Mm -hmm. You know, and I try and, like, then I think about the song. What did I do in the session? What did the engineer, what did the mixer want in the session? What did the producer want in the session? And then I say, like, okay. Like, I heard a song today. I can't say who it is. And I did the song and I did what I thought sound, it would sound good for streaming. And the mixer came back and said, I think I want you to do this. And I heard the song today and it sounded a little lower and a little, maybe not lower, maybe darker than what I had done. And it didn't sit well in the playlist. And I was like, I was right. <laughs> but I can't, you know what I'm saying? Like I can only advise people, you know, and say, hey, this is what I think. And I mean, the song's great. It was fine, you know, yep. but... I just feel like, I feel like I was right. Yeah. You know, like not, I'm not going to call the guy and say, hey, I told you, but <laughs> I just feel like I was right. So with the next record, I'll be a little more conscious of. No. And I mean, how much would you say this job, this business is trusting your gut? Well, that's kind of what you're paying for here. Yeah. Like I said before, you're paying for my 40 years of not screwing up or, or figuring out when I screw up how to fix it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of feel like. When you hire me to master a record, are you hiring me to just do what you want to do or you're hiring me what I think is best for you? Yeah. You know? No. It's like if you go to a doctor and he says, hey, don't do this. Your knee, you, my knee hurts. Well, don't, you know, stop playing soccer for a week or whatever. Or stop weightlifting, you know, whatever. And you say, nah, thanks. I'm just going to go whatever. And your knee doesn't get better. Maybe you went to the doctor to get advice and you're not taking it. So. You know, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I play one on TV, but, you know, you, I, I just, I don't know. You know, when it comes to that for engineers who are coming up in the game, I think one thing that is missing in a lot of people's lives that, you know, are doing this now versus people who have done this in the past, and I think that the internet is making up for it in a roundabout way, is mentorship, you know? Absolutely. And and who are your mentors and I know some of them, Tom and a few other people, but... I mean, I, I worked under Herb Powers and Tom Coyne. I was their assistant for six years. Yeah. Today, kids come here, and if they're not in the studio in a year, they're like, what's going on? I'm like, a year? You just graduated school. Mm -hmm. Like, how can you think that after one year, you should be on your own doing sessions? 
you know, and we have rates here. We have senior engineer rates and assistant rates. And these kids want to do it for like a quarter of the price of the assistant rate. I'm like, that's not a business model. You know, you doing $50 a song is not a business model that you can run. You living in your, your apartment and doing, you know, two songs a day, making a hundred bucks a day. Yeah, that works for you. But as a business, it doesn't work for us here. Mm -hmm. So I just feel like when I came up, you had to work in a studio. It wasn't someone's house. It was a studio. And you learned from everybody in the studio how to be an engineer, what to do or what not to do by looking at who's doing right, right and wrong. And it took time. You literally like, you literally had to develop your own style and your own ways to do that, but you absorbed all the good things from everybody else. What I learned from Tom Coyne and her powers was what is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. You know, before them, you know, I would listen to like, you know, what Bob Ludwig did and be like, what is this guy, you know, what is he doing that makes him so good? Or Ted Jensen, you know, or Greg Calby, you know, who I work with now. Um, you know, I really researched like, you know, good mastering. And mm -hmm. it wasn't just like, records that i liked it was records i never heard of i would find out like oh this guy masters oh let me check this out you know and see what he did and you know then as i came up i would meet these people and i would just ask them a million questions yep you know and i think i think mentoring is how you learn the business not just engineering it's how you learn the business because without the business aspect you it's going to be very hard to be a good engineer if you can't maintain the business side of this i mean there's a creative part where we're all like, yeah, I'm super creative and that's all I care about is the art form. I'm super creative. I don't know anything about the fucking computers. Or, uh, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm the least technical guy here, but I understand the musicality of it and the business part of it. And that's what I think is really important. And I feel like being in a studio environment or having a mentor is how you really learn. You know, going online and listening to everybody, everybody argues about everything. You know, the whole thing about the pancakes and the waffle. You know, like, it li it's the truth. It's like, you know, I feel bad for the this new generation having to go through all this internet bull crap. It's just arguing and people saying they're right and you don't know what they've done or why they say they're right or, you know, like, reviews on equipment and processing and all this stuff. I, can't, I just can't even keep up with it and I can't even figure it out. Like for me, it's getting a piece of gear and putting it up and saying, oh, does this work? Just like, you know, what we did today. Like I sweep through it, I turn knobs, I, I go extreme and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, being in a studio is a place where you can do that and like really like get other people's opinions. Like, oh, don't do this, try this on this. You know, like someone will come, like, you know, Tom and Herb used to be like, I'll give you a little secret. Turn this knob this way, you know, turn the threshold here and reduce the, you know, the output and see what happens. And I'm like, oh, wow, you know, and, you know, it's just so much better than going online. It's having somebody like teach you this stuff and, and you're in the room with them and then saying, watch what I do. Yeah. You know, and you can watch someone like turn the knobs and be like, okay, now I see it. You know, you pick up little things. Just reading doesn't, re there's no, there's no like, the, there's no small details in, in reading stuff online. Mm -hmm. It's watching it in person. You know, like even when I was doing recording and mixing, it's the little things that you watch somebody do that is really like this, it's seriously the magic of their talent, you know? Absolutely, so, the devil's in the details. Yeah. You, you know, one thing I find very interesting about, you, you know, your uh, your work is your relationship with your assistant. You guys have been working together for a long time. About and, 20 years. You know, <laughs> that seems like there's no ego there you know you do your job he does his job and you both want to be completely successful yeah so he's got my back all the time when it comes to like getting stuff done and getting stuff out and you know like i do all my mastering i do all my revisions <clears throat> but that being said i still trust his ears as a secondary thing where he's like hey you know song 13 why don't you revisit that? You know, I don't like the way the limiter's working on that one compared to the other ones. And he'll give me that feedback. And that's what is the relationship is about, mm -hmm. is that I do that with my clients and he does that with me. So it's constantly, like everybody's checking each other, everybody's giving feedback, and everybody's looking out for the, the best the record could be. That's and, awesome. you know, that's something that you learn over time. You know, like egos, <clears throat> egos in the studio and being like, oh, you know, like I'm doing what I do. And, you know, like 
I've never been like, you know, hey man, I mastered your record. I don't want to hear from you. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. That's not the way the world works. You know, like people are always like, oh, he's so critical or this person's so critical. I was like, welcome to my world. You know, like I'll work on a record and I'll get notes sometimes. Like I'll literally get a note where it's like, it's perfect. It's great. And you know what? That's a that's like a rare thing. I usually get notes back where people are like, I think we lost the direction of the vibe. Maybe it's to this now. And I, I have to be open to that mm -hmm. because, you know, I didn't get that information before. And now I get the information. Now I have to go back and rework the project with that information. So it's just, it's part of the process. Like if you can't deal with criticism, you shouldn't be in the music business. Absolutely. You know, like every, everybody's a critic now <laughs> and everybody's got something to say, but really when it comes down to the producer and the artist, they are, they're the creators of this. So I have to listen to them. Yes. You know, and I, and you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm like, whatever you guys say, you know, there'll be one small percentage every now and then where I'm like, you guys are doing something wrong here. Mm -hmm. Come to my studio, listen to this or go somewhere where it's, you have a good system and listen to this because you're going to lose this magic that I'm hearing here. Mm -hmm. And that's what I get afraid of a lot of times when people don't come here is that they don't hear this magical moment that's going on here or they're not hearing it the way I do. Yes. And I tell people every time, like, you know, people come in here not in the music business. And I, when they sit in the chair, I'm like, you're going to hear this song the way it's supposed to sound. Not close, not almost not this is the best you're gonna hear it this is this is ground zero this is the spot this chair facing that way is the way you're gonna hear the song that it's supposed to sound like yeah and it i i will say for everybody at home who has not experienced listening in this room it is a magical experience i have never wanted floors or person <laughs> size speakers more you know i mean that's what it's supposed to be though that's what that's what's supposed to happen here in the studio is that you're supposed to there's magic that's supposed to happen that you can't explain yeah but i also want to say this to the camera and all the people out there on the internet that i know for a fact that even if i went and bought these atcs i don't have this room and even if i got thomas to build another one of these for me i'm not making the decisions that you're making you well know? that's the thing is like <laughs> there's so many little factors that go into what's supposed to happen that um I don't think you can just, you know, rebuild it and do it somewhere else. No, they have to come here. Yeah. 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 You know, it's just, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, like everybody here does something special. Randy does something special. Greg does something special. Joe Laporta does something special. Ted and Ryan in Nashville, all the guys, Adam, everybody does something special here in their own way that clients here and are attracted to and mm -hmm. that's the, that's the draw you know as a collective for all of us is that we all draw from different people i mean there's a lot of cross-pollination with clients and all kinds of things going on like we always make jokes like that was my client it's like nobody's you know the clients are out there you know what i'm saying and they come to you for certain reasons and certain projects so when you have so many amazing engineers you know and you say that was my client at some point do you guys all really truly believe they're sterling sounds clients you'd like to but <laughs> nobody like i mean i have a couple really loyal clients that yeah. use me you know for everything or as much as they can and i'm beyond appreciative to those people i generally give those people like you know, I'll give them the extra that they need, you know, and mm -hmm. that's what you do as an engineer. But it's very hard to say that someone can be loyal in a creative aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, each project draws different needs and direction, mm -hmm. and you hope that you can fill those spaces for each client, but it's not always the case, and that's the way it is, you know? Absolutely. So You know, um, but... If a client does decide to, you know, move to another engineer, are you happy that they move across the hall instead of across the well, country? Well, as an owner, I'm much more happy that, <laughs> that they move across the hall than down the street. Yes. So, yes. You know, I mean, I'd rather see the guys that work here mm -hmm. do the work than somebody else. And not, not dissing like, oh, I don't want everybody else to work, but it's just, you know, I'm a business owner. I'd like to see <laughs> the business stay here. No. So, and, I, and I also like to know that like the guys that work here that aren't my partners mm -hmm. are drawing in people that are like really interested in them. Yeah. You know, like 
Joe Laporta does all this hip hop stuff that, you know, I started my career in hip hop and I don't really do it anymore, but Joe does. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Randy does a lot of pop stuff that, you know, like I don't do. So he's doing a lot of stuff. We cross pollen, we all do. I mean, Greg does his lane and I kind of do my lane, but you know, we all kind of like, it all kind of switches around the four rooms a little bit. That's amazing. So, so do you remember the first time you heard Sterling sound? Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, you know, I was like a kid looking at liner notes and I was like Sterling sound and like, you know, then as I started getting more interested in engineering, there was more Sterling sound showing up and, mm -hmm. you know, all these things. I mean, this, you know, the big psychedelic furs album with ghost and you on it. Like I remember hearing that record and be like, this thing sounds so amazing. And I looked at the notes and I was like, Greg Calby, Sterling sound, like that guy's really good. You know, and I was like, I was working at this little studio out here in Jersey, mm -hmm. you know, like with aspirations of being a big engineer. And I would just see Greg's name on all this really cool alternative rock stuff. And then I met him one time at AES. And uh, I was like, wow. I was just like, I felt like a, like a, an idiot just asking him a million questions. You know, like, oh my God, when you worked on this record, like what, whatever. And he was just like, you know, like you think like everybody's going to remember every single specific record they ever worked on or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of like, he was, you know, he was really nice to me and just like told me all these things or whatever. You know, and I, I appreciate that. And now I see Greg every day and we talk about golf you know, <laughs> or like lunch. <laughs> see, I, I can probably understand how you felt then because I feel that way now. <laughs> and thank you so much for letting us in here. No, I mean, thanks for coming. This is like, this has been, this is a re really good place right now. You know, um, I've got to ask for the camera and for the people out there on the internet, you have had the chance to try the Sontic Windows version. It exists. How to go? So, <laughs> um, it literally brought me back to using the Sontech in the rack mm -hmm. because like I was saying, a lot of regular EQs, you move it and you hear it very drastically and very, in just a way that it sounds like, okay, that's 5k, that's 8k, that's a hundred Hertz. And that's all it is. And the Sontech has this magical space about it where when you turn the knobs, you don't necessarily hear it as much as you think you would or whatever. It's just when it goes into the right places, you hear it in, a, in the right way. Mm -hmm. And it does something to the music in the right way. Like, it's weird. Like, I can't explain EQing a bass on a regular EQ and on a Sontek. On a Sontek, it's a very subtle but it, the, the voids that you're trying to fill a lot of times are filled in a different way. And I really like miss that about not working on a Sontech for the last couple of years. And now I feel like that's going to come back and, <laughs> you know, and the, the, just the ability of doing, you know, mid side in a discreet way that actually works. And it's not so overtly like, oh, now the reverb's up too much, or this is, this is too much. This is all subtle little musical things. And I keep saying, I kept saying it to you before, is that it's musically correct. And to me, like, that's what it's about. When the EQ is musically correct, mm -hmm. there's some kind of magic that's going to happen there and not just like frequencies or whatever. But I wish I could keep the secret to myself, but now I guess it's going to come out. <laughs> well, you know, I will say right now, you're the only guy at Sterling with the, the Sontech on, on a computer. So everybody else, if they want to go do it, they still got to print it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, it, it really took, it, you took me back to a place that I haven't been in a long time today. That's amazing. And it's kind of weird that I actually, like I always thought I was progressive, like moving forward. And now I went back and now I'm kind of like, all right, now I'm going to go back a little. <laughs> I'm literally going to go back and see what I can do. I'd love to go back on a couple records. All the stuff that we were listening to today, I was like, ooh, you know, like maybe, oh, that record came out like six months ago. <laughs> you know, like I can't go back, but it would be, it's going to be interesting going forward. Yes. You know with this EQ and see where it takes me. Yeah, I'm very excited to hear yeah. what you think. Please send me any any feelings you have, any thoughts, you know, I want to know everything. Yeah. Um you, you know, we spoke about this, but when was the first time you came in contact with the Soundtech? Um well, during my career early on, I'd seen them, but you know, a lot of studios didn't have them. You mm -hmm. know, it was pretty much 
Sterling Sound for various reasons. But when I came, I came here 23 years ago and every room had one. And the Sontech that was in my room was originally Bob Ludwig's that he mastered like, I don't know, a Zeppelin album on. And I was like, okay, this is, you know, I'm getting goosebumps thinking about this. And then I started using it and I was like, what have I been missing all these years? Like, you know, I was using GMLs and all these other EQs and then I got on the Sontech and I was like, holy, like, what's happening? Like, this is like, this is special. This EQ really does things that none, none of the other EQs do, mm-hmm. you know, in a, in a very subtle but magical way, a musical way. I'm going to keep saying that. No, no, I like I'm just it. I'm going to keep saying that. <laughs> Everything became more musical. Yeah. So. Yeah. And earlier today, we, uh, I think we got some of the footage, but, you know, when you were using that thing, that was the term that you kept throwing out there that. You know, it was very musical to your ears. Because it, it's just, it's like, you have to listen to it. You have to listen to it, and the music goes through it. And then, like, all of a sudden, you know, I was sweeping, and I just was like, oh, wow. Like, that's not just like, it wasn't like I was just raising it 2 dB at 60 hertz. Mm-hmm. It was like, there was something happening between 40 and 80 that was, like, musical. Yep. You know, I was like, wow, this is really cool. That's awesome. Really cool. And the shelves and everything are just way different than any other shelves you've heard there's just they're apparently different in their sound Mm -hmm. and again more musical you know and while they're different you know you and i'm just trying to fill in the blanks for the people at home but you mean that they're different in the sense they don't react like another equalizer that's out there but you do you feel like they react to the like the sontec that you're used to absolutely they react exactly like the sontec that i'm used to that's awesome which is something that like if you've never worked in a sontec you 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 won't understand it because it's just like like every other eq out there i mean they basically all sound the same Mm -hmm. because of what they're modeled after yeah and this Sontech is sounds like a Sontech. Mm-hmm. Like it literally feels like it when you're working on it. So, you know, if you've never had one, this is going to be new ground for you. And it may change the way you work. I mean, I'm positive it's going to change. This EQ is going to change the way a lot of people work. That's awesome. You know, so. And we don't want to give away too much for the people at home. But, you know, we have some stuff that we've been talking about. That's pretty exciting to me. Yes, we feeling? have. And I feel like... Um, mm. I've always thought about this. I mean, this is like, you know, it's like a pinnacle moment from, from my career. Like, mm-hmm. wow, I'd actually be able to make something. And, you know, after these last couple of days of like talking to you guys and like really like, you know, finding out who you guys are and what you guys want to make and your ideas, I feel like this is, could be something, you know, really cool. You awesome. know, when I met you guys at NAM, you know, was my son Tommy was like you gotta meet this guy he knows a lot about like making plugins or whatever and I was like yeah cool cool and then I met you guys and it was funny everywhere I went around NAM, you know people like you know the you know the guys (laughs) the guys are here and they got all this cool shit and you were walking around with that laptop it was like you know you just had it open to the Sontech and people were like oh is that a Sontech you know like literally I was talking to people and people were like that guy's walking by with a Sontech on a laptop. You know, it's like, a lot of people don't know. I mean, people know about it, but they've never used it. So you had a lot, there was a lot of buzz going on. But I feel like this, you know, like after hearing this, I feel like we're going to make something really good. I'm, I'm like very, really good. I'm very happy to hear that. And, you know, hopefully next year we'll be walking around with something. That people are like, hey, what oh, yeah. is that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I like, you know, I just want to take my experience over 40 years and you know my workflow and everything, and say, hey guys, this is what I, this is what I envision, and you guys just throw it in a box. I think we're gonna a really do really cool box. I think we're <laughs> gonna do just that. Yeah, so. no, I'm exci- I'm really excited about that. Well, thank you so much for your time and for having us, Chris. Oh man, thank you. <laughs> I, it's all thank you, all you guys, seriously. Well, so awesome. Excellent. <laughs>